Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always. And today we are joined by Sebastian Miro, the CEO of Clearlight Saunas International, a global leader in infrared sauna manufacturing. Passionate about wellness, entrepreneurship, and making a positive impact, Sebastian has been an entrepreneur since 16 and is dedicated to building strong teams, developing innovative products, and making a positive difference in the world. He's an active member of several global networks and mentoring programs, and when not working, enjoys spending time with his family, listening to business books, and enjoying nature in Byron Bay, Australia. I've asked Sebastian to join us here today to share his story, plus how we can all have the best day ever every day and support others in achieving their dreams. So Sebastian, thank you so much for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for the invitation. Happy to be here. Yeah. So 16 is pretty early the start. So was that your first business? Do you come from a family of entrepreneurs? Is that why? No, not at all. I think it was, so first of all, the business was making particular skateboards, flexible skateboards that sort of went really fast because the shock absorbed the, the surface in unevenness and therefore they were really smooth to ride. And the way that that came about was more because I loved surfing and where I lived, you couldn't surf. Like Northern, I'm from Northern Germany. There's no, there are no waves. So that was the second best. <laughs> and uh, so that was one reason, but no, my, my parents, my mom worked in bookkeeping and bank and actually during the time that the kids were young for the for 20 years she, she was at home my dad a teacher philosopher and ethic professor that type of thing and then i think the main influence was a teacher at school and i didn't have a really linear way through school i was not particularly good in complying really what school was asking for and i don't think i understood it i'm also dyslexic that didn't help that we discovered that. But at the end of the day, to answer your question, it was a teacher who said, look, eBay is coming online. This is the type of thing that's happening. Everyone needs to go and do find a startup. Startup was a term suddenly. And so I said to my brother who was living next to my room, oh, we need to do something too. Let's build skateboards for ourselves. And if we really like them, we sell them for others. And so we sold a few, not many before we actually realized it's the internet that we need to do. And so we went into the internet, but skateboards was the first thing, yes. Got it. So you started with skateboards and then you said you went into internet. What do you mean you went into internet? Into the internet. So back then, I don't know if you've ever heard it, but like the modem made a sound and talked to a <laughs> remote modem. And that type of thing. It was quite ex exciting, actually. It so was it exciting. Was really That's, yeah. yeah and, that was, and so, that was me. <laughs> same teacher, actually, was saying, it was our economics teacher. And he said, you have to buy shares, you have to do startups, and you really have to understand the space. And so we started with coding really there was me and my classmates really simple websites just for ourselves for a couple of months and then somehow we said what would it really take to find customers and so we discussed that and said he, his dad was a businessman so he had it knew about other people that were running businesses and so a friend of mine at school said look i'm really good with graphics let's start this and let's you do the coding i love coding and i grew up with doing commodore 64 commodore 16 so in the 80s coding really simple stuff that had no graphic interface whatsoever, just numbers and words. So, so I was familiar to, with that. And so I went into yeah doing websites and later on content management systems that I coded with the code and my business partner, he did the interfaces for the graphic and so on, and his company still exists. And uh, yeah, really. So, so, I, yeah, so I went out of it eventually going a very different direction simply because I was more passionate for the environment and stuff like that. So I did a bit of a U-turn then and into somewhere completely different. Got it. So that's, it's very entrepreneurial. It's very early stage adopter. We've actually had a guest on the show multiple times, Ken McCarthy. He was the original internet marketing, digital marketing guru. He did the first mm seminar on how to use the internet to market your business and he had um what's his name now the guy that coded the netscape the world's first mark andreessen yeah, yeah. first internet browser so he was a speaker at this kim mccarthy's conferences is actually where the banner ad was created and they were doing video for business advertising before porn even got a hold of video that's oh, how yeah. back in the day it was oh. yeah i guess this internet thing's here to stay i don't know it's been a minute it's very interesting to hear that you got like that. started so long ago. Have you always been involved now since then and online in some capacity? Is that still a major part of what you guys are doing? Yeah, certainly. Like f fast track. So I basically somehow made it in university. I was quite surprised that I 
that they took me and it took me that someone offered to me a PhD to realize, oh, maybe I'm not that dumb. And I really mean it. Like I, I was really like, I'm she, I had such, such an imposter syndrome all through my studies. I think mm. I'm not meant to hear, but somehow I get through this. And like, I was actually doing the work, but I didn't recognize it. I thought, oh, I'm just lucky. And only when someone offered a PhD, I thought, oh, okay, maybe I'm actually not that dumb. So that was when I was 25. So, so quite late, I even maybe even 28. But so, so even during my studies, and there was climate change related stuff, particularly and the economic flow on effects on New Zealand, where I lived at the time and, and studied, you can always use online skills for this type of thing, right? Like the way that I wrote my thesis was really integrated, it was really advanced. Again, coding actually as well to pull all the different references to make beautiful graphics. You use these skills in other ways, but at the end of the day, when I came back to this business, which I started, we are a distributor for Australia, New Zealand, wider Europe and UK of a US founder company that was founded by now, probably 20, 25 years ago. And so we jumped on board 10 years ago and that there was also a bit of a happenstance. It just randomly happened. But at the end of the day, I was able to have no budget and be still able to create websites in many different countries more in, instantaneous. They didn't have to wait for a marketing agency to, to do that or have the funds right. for that. So it really helped me later on to have these skills to actually test the market. So understand how AdWords work, how other things mm. work, just to see that type of thing. Yeah, I love that you mentioned that. Test the market. So are you saying that you created very quick internet digital assets to test things like hooks and marketing appeal and to get customer feedback on things? Yeah. That, yeah. Yes. So I started after reading the four hour working week with Tim Ferriss by using something that he calls prototyping. And then so I didn't have a product. I only had pictures of a product. And uh, I didn't even have a telephone number. So I used the one at work and forwarded to my mobile, which was found out later. And I got a slap on my wrist on that. That's pretty naughty. It was a governmental organization too. So ne never mind. I'm not proud of that, but I'm saying like at the same time, I am actually, because that's like the entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. Like I don't want to pay Skype $5 a month for my own number. So what I basically did is I did a one pager online where I put some pictures, some prices, this telephone number. And then I went onto Google ads and just put a really small spend on it, whatever I had in my bank account, like hundred dollars or something like that. And, and looked what, what would happen and didn't take long before people actually called and said, yes, I want one. And I was like, ah, oh, okay. It's actually not here yet. <laughs> you do right. have to put a deposit down as well, because that was the only way really for me to pay for it. And it will be at least three months. That's fine. I can wait. I take the biggest one, please. And that was the first call I ever had. And I thought, oh, I'm onto something like this. This seems to be, well, good indication there. And so I took, I, I took the will of a good friend and two credit cards and just went ahead with an order of a couple of units, not many, and the deposit of a couple more people. And it just worked really well. And the reason why it worked well is because the guys in the US, our, our suppliers, had done a great job of creating a great product and a great brand that people trusted around the world. It has a lifetime warranty. It has certain patents in it that, that really make sure that it's really good for your health, like no electrosmog, no chemicals and so on. So the value proposition was good. And on top of that, I think I, I understood how to reach the market and that together was already a good starting point. Yeah. I love that. I love that. So let's recap yeah. for people that may have missed some of the genius of what happened here, which was born out of necessity and innovation, but aren't all great things. So you had a skill set that you had developed and you mm. basically put together a one page offer sheet with a phone number and you ran mm. some paid ads to your target market to be a, basically a reseller of something you mm. loved and thought was high quality that somebody else made. And at first mm. you had no product, no team, nothing, none of this. And when people called, you took a deposit, you basically pre-sold it to cover your expenses or most of your expenses to actually bring it here and fulfill on that order and get things going. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's accurate. Yeah. So for those that missed it, he leveraged other people's resources where they had gone through all the trial and tribulations to develop a great product. And not only that, but also their money to test the offers and the price points and that sort of thing. He leveraged all that. All he did was help connect them to an existing market. And even then he pre-sold it. So this is, I love using the example of Elon Musk. 
because it's just so spectacular. Elon Musk pre-sold 300, he made $300 million US pre-selling a product he had no team to build and no factory to help make. And he collected $1,000 down payments. And then he used that to build the Gigafactory to deliver on what he promised people. And you did this on a much smaller scale. I think, yes. And it's a very important part of that, why people were confident to give me a deposit. And that comes from my mindset. Like I'm the type of person that would always give money back. And at one stage, I ran into something where people lent me money years ago. And they forgot about it. And they thought, oh, we'll never get that back. Actually, not even me. It was my partner. Somehow that went. And as soon as money was there, that person was paid back. Not because they put pressure on me, but because that's the right thing to do. It was a business venture that my wife did that didn't come through. So I guess what I'm trying to say is I really had the mindset that, yes, I take a deposit. There is a risk that the customer takes. The reason why they were probably comfortable taking that risk was one, it was a strong brand. So it was not just not a no name brand, but also they probably heard my conviction that mm. I will deliver on this in one way or another. If it didn't come to fruition, I knew in myself, I would take whatever it, it takes. I would do whatever it takes to pay them back. So you really have to have that mindset. If you have the mindset, well, otherwise just the deposit is just the deposit. It is really important to have that conviction in yourself that you actually will act on that if something goes wrong, because the other side will hear that. 100%. So you had to sell them on the product, on the brand, and yeah. yourself. Yeah, true. It was part that. of that, for sure. I love that. I love that. And I just thought, I just love the whole thing where this is, again, you just leverage so much, and you just got started with like 100 bucks. And we're like, will anybody buy this? Let me see. And I think that's just such a fantastic story. What would you recommend to someone who's maybe starting out or even struggling now? They've got a business idea or concept, or they were going, and they're just, they're struggling. Yeah. They haven't. They don't have stability and predictability in their growth or income. So strategy, having a strategy is basically having a prioritization list that makes sure you focus on the things that really matter. That's one of the main things that I see go wrong. Most people seem to like, you start off having a nine to five job and have some time on the side and do something. And I believe it's super important to ask every day, what is really the most important thing? Is my website is, is there. Does it really make a difference to to check now where exactly the button needs to be, or do I need to make sure that actually the integration into the warehouse happens so that I can scale or whatever it is. Like really getting the priorities right, I think mm. it's really important. And there are lots of good books about that. So studying is so important as part of this because I've seen even big, bigger business having absolutely the wrong priority at one stage and therefore being really in stagnation. The other thing though, is it's not spending on silly things. So what I haven't said is while I had only hundred dollars in my account, I was also sleeping in my van in front of the, in the middle of Oakland and New Zealand, uh, in front of my, my office where I was employed. I would sneak in the morning around the security system, get a shower there because I didn't have a shower in my van, I'd work a little bit. And I knew when the CEO would come. So I would sneak out, get some food and then come soon after him as if I just arrived for the first time and would work my normal hours. And then again, going back into my van and do my thing. So I guess for me, it felt really empowering to know I have control over how much I spend. So I didn't spend money on rent. And a bit later on, I, I would house sit a lot for a couple of years until I said, actually, this now doesn't serve me anymore. I have the money to rent and run the business properly rather than having to move every month the whole big. I was even moving a sauna when I was house sitting so that I had my own sauna in this van around. But I guess what I'm saying is like, really watch your costs and what you spend. Because if you run out of money, you really have a problem. You have to work more just to make money. And so it's again, the priority, if you need time, then work as little as possible with as little money as you need. If you can cut down your hours by sleeping in the basement of your parents for a couple of months and do that. Like it's really, it's the budget and the prioritization, I believe, and the studying. I love that. I love that. So I think we talked before, and a lot of my listeners know about the eight critical success factors that we discovered when we spent all this time and money go through all the academic literature. And one of those is money management of the eight critical success factors, right? There's self-efficacy, market intelligence, strategic planning, marketing strategy, sales strategy and skills, money management, business operations, business intelligence. Those are the eight critical success. And under money management, when we looked at what makes successful money management in a small and medium-sized business, 
One, which you talked about is capacity utilization, which is a really fancy word for meaning get everything you can from all you've got. It's a fancy capacity utilization, big fancy word. It means get everything you can from what you've got in terms of your employees, your resources, your finances, and even like labor productivity and intensity. So that's one. The other one was low capital investment, leanness. And this we found was my theory, I should say, my hypothesis of why this is such a strong signal is because it forces you to lean on your customers and prove that they want it and that they're going to invest in it and that it's a viable business model. Because if it's not profitable from the get-go, it's not going to last long. And then the next one was being debt-free because the first thing, like you said, cash is so important. If you have a large amount of debt that you're trying to service, it will crush your cash flow. It'll suck up your reserves. And the goal may not be money per se, but it, money is to a business what fuel is to a jet engine. And without it, you're not going to go very far. And then, and then we can talk about the other things that, that for money management, but just to speak to what you said, like just you, you did the most you could, you made every dollar work. You Mm -hmm. proved it was profitable from the get go. You leveraged so much other stuff. You went and found the high quality product and service somebody else had done. And I guess it sounds like really for you, most of your investment in the beginning, considering that you were a redistributor was really in investing in assets for sales growth. So whether it was more yeah. marketing or a phone team, you speak to me, you tell me, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like part of how you grew and scaled. Yeah. Is that, yeah? Exactly. Yeah. And you just focus on what is really needed. I think it, it, this first phone system that we had wasn't a phone system. It was just a Skype number. <laughs> and that was, well, because you just pay for what you use, that type of thing. And the local sales and the Australian sales were fairly simple because it's not expensive to call in. So customers were happy also to call my cell phone and stuff like that. And it's really... If you hear a customer saying, hey, I really don't like ringing this number, you can probably say, okay, this is smoke. There's probably a fire. Many people might not actually take the action because they don't like to call me. So it's a friction point and you check how much would it cost mm. to do that. And, and if you know there's another friction point, then you that's coming back to strategy. What's really the pro- priority that you need to do here? And said, okay, we need a better warehouse or we need better, we need MailChimp or anything like that. Like we went through so many systems, but I'm com- comfortable changing quickly when needed. So in the beginning, my leads were in a spreadsheet. Then they were in Dendesk, I believe, for half a year. Then they were in Zoho. Then they were in Salesforce. Then they went in, in InfusionShop. We went to what vehicle worked because I wasn't afraid of that type of change because I understand tech well mm. enough. I love this. I still just love the genius of it because so many people, they say the pioneers get the arrows, the settlers get the land. And so you didn't have to be the pioneer of this product and the manufacturing process and where the source of materials... You just came in, you were like when they, like when you hear about an animal that got on a plane and got to like an, an ecosystem had never been in, and it just like spreads like wildfire because it just has no natural predators. And it's almost like what you did. You were like, hey, they, I'm going to just be here where there's no one and just totally dominate this side of the world and own it. And I just hats off to you on that. Now, what were some of your biggest challenges and struggles? Capacity, probably. So I've been doing this for 10 years. And after about four years, I realized that they're real capacity issues in my own time but also in my thinking and if I don't understand something then that's so first employee came along as someone who actually stayed for eight years and moved through the ranks of different things we are over 40 people now around the world plus a really strong network of suppliers as well that that do a lot of we don't install ourselves we have an installer network Mm, that type mm, of thing mm. but we started off really, really small and so I guess if someone suggests and something to innovate in your business and you don't understand it, there's a chance that you actually say no. And that can be really tangible things like, hey, we need this better tool because it helps me so much more to work. I, for example, I need a better CRM system that automatically sends reminders and emails and so on. That's easy to understand and to look into. But if someone actually says, hey, we need someone who is an expert in this field, and I'm like, I don't even know what I'm looking for. So I can't write a job description anymore because I'm out of my depth. I don't even understand where I want to go to is another thing, but it's knowledge that really can really hold you back if you don't understand what structure you need to have to go to wherever you want to go. First of all, you need to know where you go. That's super important. That can be a pitfall. So sometimes we didn't think big enough. And it took me, I mentioned the PhD offer. That was a big one for me to get confidence. Another one was I randomly worked in a co-working space next to someone who worked for a really big bank. Was, and that bank was just around the corner. And he said, I give you an in with that bank and you can talk whether you can 
open an account and so on. And that bank, just the way that the level that he was operating was fairly high. Therefore, it wasn't just one person coming around the corner from that bank, but it was the foreign exchange. It was the hatching person. It was the credit card person. It was, I believe, with five or six people in total, trade finance person, you name it, all really high level. And that really helped to elevate my own thinking because I came, I thought, okay, I give them my blue sky thinking of making a million or something like that, like really big numbers. And I showed them and I could just feel in them, all right, it's on a smaller side. Of course, this will be done. <laughs> It's something we can work with. If you, yeah, and j just in that conversation, I just realized, wow, this mm. is really common. This is really doable. Many people do it. Many people succeed, and that gave me a lot of confidence in it. And I used these people, not their service. Like eventually, I used their services. In the beginning, it was really just I just had an account with them, but I had still access to these people that also I would then ask, hey, I actually want to get go to X. Should I do this? For example, should I hedge my US dollars against whatever? And they would say, at this point here, you will have to, it makes sense. At the moment, it's more distraction for you. And I note that. And I guess what I'm saying that again, is like the knowledge can be really good to have early of where you want to go. And that's really one of the pitfalls. Another one that I think I was really good with, but I've seen some of my fellow entrepreneurs really running into trouble is when you start a business, you realize that part of the price is VAT, if you're in California, for example, or in, in Europe or many parts of the world. And also you get your money back if, if in terms of taxes, you can save taxes. And I found I'm still not really enticed to spend money just because I know it's for the business and you get, in a sense, a tax relief because you have less profit. And the same of this car costs not really 100,000, it's just 90,000 because 10% 10, 10 you get back as VAT, where you right. still pay for a $90,000 car. And, and so in the co-working space, these fancy laptops, these fancy headsets, these fancy clothes and all the rest of it, whatever works. And it, the pain point there is that I'm thinking like, yeah, but it doesn't get you any further. You, yeah. you don't get more deals because you have a really fancy computer. I would get the best computer, but secondhand because I needed fast computers for that type of thing. And I believe that critical thinking is important. Like, is this a shiny object or is this really getting me more leverage that I need right now? Yeah, I love that. I love that. Just running lean and really focusing on what is the next step. Maybe it's a little off topic, but when I, one of my first businesses was a martial arts school I ran for three years. And when I first started Ooh. teaching, before I even opened up as a business, I was running like a rec club kind of thing. And I would always kind of, what am I going to teach tonight? What am I going to teach tonight? What am I going to teach? And after about a year of teaching, I realized it was less about what I was going to teach. It was more about what people needed to learn. That if I had the blueprints for a 10 story Lego building, but they were just stuck at level three, trying to get level four, all my knowledge, level five, six, all that above was irrelevant. They just needed to get that next step. And that's almost what you're saying. You can have these big giant dreams and even maybe think bigger than you are now for those listening. But at the same time, you have to look at the next steps in front of you and executing those really well. And some people might say, oh, I had a, actually had a friend, we had this conversation, he was making a lot of money and he's, I bought this salami sandwich and I didn't get the premium. And so I think I'm going to go buy this expensive car because he's doing like a quarter of a million dollars a month now, like net. So this is after his expenses. And he's just, I feel like I'm stuck in this old mentality. And I told him, I was like, keep that mentality. Like, first off, I do believe that don't, I always say, don't betray the behaviors that got you where you are. Although you mm -hmm. may need new ones to get further, right? But don't betray the behaviors. And so he was, was like, I didn't get the premium salami. And he's, maybe I feel like I'm unworthy. I'm making so much money now. I should. And then he was telling me he wants to buy this fancy car. And I'm like, bro, where you're living right now, there are so many break-ins and cars. Like, you just want to paint a big target on your back. Spend on the experiences, right? Spend on the, get yourself the premium salami. But <laughs> that mentality of what are you going to do with a flashy car? What do you need? You want the attention of the gang that's, you want to worry about where you're going to park if they're secure. Like you, why are you doing that? And I just love what you're talking about. It's just be realist and almost have a big vision and operate lean. I love that so much. Yeah. What are some of the other big mistakes that you feel people are making? Anything else? Yeah, I see you can really amplify way more what's working well like there's overall people like to fix the machine and look at what's not working well or it's working well enough i will move on talking about about, about adwords like just because it works doesn't mean i now have to go to facebook but if it still works how far can i go i think it's often that people underestimate how big the market is 
and and therefore just look for the next thing. I've I'm on a couple of boards of, of companies and I can see that they say we did the flyer drop. And then you ask for how many suburbs and how many flyers? How about thousands? Yes. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah. So how many more suburbs can you actually service in with your business there half of the city? Oh, okay, okay. So the flyer drop needs to happen there. If your return is fine, that's really important then to do that. Yeah. So I found that's yeah. I love that. And then I think I love that. I keep going. I'm going to come back to that. The flyer drop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But being prolific is certainly something that output has to be proper. And then something. So I'm in Byron normally with my family, and what I meet a lot of entrepreneurs. And what I can see is that there is. It's exciting. There's a buzz. There are other entrepreneurs, and I just see that some people they use networks well, and they, they really get more business to it. So it makes sense these partnerships. But I've seen also. A lot of people that just like to surround themselves with other business people <laughs> a lot and don't do the work and things. And I get it. It's actually nice. I enjoy that too. Talking about business, talking about your wins, finding solutions and so on. But actually having a smaller group of people that you connect regularly in a mastermind or something can be really good because I hold you accountable. And I said, hey, you said this two months ago and you need to do that. You still haven't done that. You don't get that if you constantly move around and looking for opportunities when you have already enough, like mm. looking for that one silver bullet that gets you further because it's a new partnership with an Ooh, affiliate. Silver bullets. Likely. silver bullets are terrible. I, I found that really tricky because it tricks you into a thinking that this is the solution for it. And you can sometimes think that way, but you have to step back and say, what is working already? Or is the issue actually somewhere else? And do you really want to put all your eggs in one basket and hope that this person gets onto your podcast and suddenly you sell so much more of your product? If you're realistic, often that's not the, the case. Right. I love that. I love that. I love that. Mm. I love that. I want to talk. So <laughs> silver bullets, people are looking for that one trick pony. They're always looking for the shortcut. I know that other people had to do knock on a hundred doors, but I'm going to do it knocking on 10. I don't know about that. So you can hope for the, yeah. Hope for the best plan for the worst. I want to talk about this flyer drop thing. Cause when you said that, I was like, I've so many clients. Hey, we did this promotion. It worked amazing. What are we going to do next? What do you mean? What are you going to do next? Yeah, is it working? <laughs> Double down then. <laughs> yeah, let's do more of that. Let's do more yeah. of that. Let's do that. Let's do it in isolated ways. Cause I think a lot of people feel like, cause they know, like, I know I did the buy one, get one offer to this group mm -hmm. of people. And I gave them a deadline. And so how can I give this buy one, get one offer to this other group of people? What if the first group finds out? Don't send it to the first group. Have segments, have markets, have territories. That's why you do this thing. You can use technology too. That's something we can maybe get into. But I love that you talked about this. I think I want to mention this. I think it's a fantastic idea to do consistent, regular promotions. One a month, if not one a week to a different segment, if you can. And track the results and the ones that work well go into your portfolio of A, B, promotions thing. that you just pull out on a regular yeah. basis. Yeah. And I think that's just like you said, you if you do 12 promotions in a year and eight of them bomb, but you have four ones that work, you do those ones again next year. And then you make a new eight and you just keep getting rid of the stuff that doesn't work and you keep building and moving forward. I think that's fantastic. So we talked about that flyer drop. I was like, let's talk about this. Because so many people do that. So many people do that. What else did you say? You talked about mastermind and accountability. Oh, sorry. What did you want to say? Actually, just something that came to mind is that often entrepreneurs are quite creative. Right. And therefore, the strength is really to come up with new ideas. And look, at least 50 to 60% are like that. That's, that can be really tricky because boring is profitable and profitable is exciting Ooh. again. Like it, it's, so if you, bore, if you do the boring thing, so as you said, hey, it's working. And you double down, which is like nothing new. It's the same. It's carrying water, chopping wood, but it really gets you to a profitable position. If you want a new product range or a new partnership or something, that's all very well. But be sure that you look at what's actually making the money here and how can I improve that? It's not exciting as the rest, but you only, if you take your eye off that main income that you might have, you will not have the opportunities to do this forever yep. because you will be bankrupt before you know it. And so it's really important that, guard that as yes you have to do this this is your duty which is different to yes i'm an exciting excited entrepreneurs and i do all these different things you do that first and that's absolutely your duty and then you can structure how often you do other things that take you away from that and i had to learn that by le learning my personality which is a creative one and i would have loved to do 10 projects this quarter and 20 projects this right. quarter and the team is like what next we can't keep up and, and then we found a structure of two projects per quarter not more. And if the projects are not done, 
next quarter no project we will finish this first and not constantly sure you need to know that you still it's still the right project but my point right. is really like you can't constantly come up with new stuff it's too fast most of the time i love that it's because we have to do iteration right there's a lot of people yeah. don't think there's a simple engineering formula that is brainstorm research prototype build and most people are in the research prototype phase and they don't even realize it and when their business doesn't succeed it's because they never iterated enough uh naval is mm -hmm. one of my heroes naval ravikant he had yeah. 70 successful exits 10 of them were unicorns these are billion dollar valuations early investor in twitter four square squares all the uber all these companies you wouldn't even believe and he says it's not 10,000 hours, it's 10,000 iterations. And I can't, I couldn't agree, I couldn't agree more. YouTube, if people go and use archive.org and they look up youtube.com and you go look at the earliest days, is YouTube was a dating site. It was, I am looking for between the ages of, it was YouTube, it was your tube to just share your life and your stories and find your partner. That's how YouTube started. Like people don't understand how many iterations these things take. I just love it. The two projects per quarter. <laughs> I love that. Can we talk a little bit more about boring is profitable? Because I want to say this, when I just want to say this, and I'm, I almost want to offend some people when I say this, but the reason why you can't do the boring thing is because you lack mental fortitude. It's not because you're creative. It's not any of that. Yes, your creative idea, but that inch wide mile deep, it takes grit and determination and focus and mental fortitude do it until it becomes dull and then keep going until it's beautiful. I think it's easy yeah. to dabble in the superficial and the new and new, oh, in the sense, right, to have that grit and real creativity. One of the best, one of the, I forget his name, but there was a famous artist. And what he used to do when he ever got stuck with a project is he would just remove his favorite part of it and then try to continue uh -huh. from there forward because he had uh -huh. to stay committed to the plan. And whenever he was working on a, a sculpture or a painting, yeah. He just felt like I just can't, he would just erase or destroy his favorite part of it and then go, now I got to take this and complete it. And that's what I'm talking about. That is a creative process and the grit to work wow. through this. It just So can you speak a bit more to boring is profitable? What are some of the boring things that are very profitable? Hatching your exchange rate is something that I'm so not interested in. It's just my personality. I don't like currency exchange and I don't, yeah, I, it's just something that, that doesn't interest me. But really early on, you you have to have a cash flow forecast. And then you look like, okay, this is how much money comes in that much I have to pay. And then you think, oh, what I have to pay is in, in a different currency. Okay, that can really fluctuate. So I need to go into hedging. There's certainly one thing that I'm not passionate about. Insurance, this is something that we've used multiple times in, in the past. And it's something like that I'm so not passionate about. But in the beginning, it was me having to look after our insurance for delivery, liability, mm. if someone gets hurt by and so on. So these are all things that are like back office things. It's not, it's certainly not shiny, unless you're really that, that person that loves it. And those people that love it, for them, it's a downfall because they go so much into the fine print and they said, this will do, move on, <laughs> don't get this perfect. And it will not make you more money to have the insurance mm -hmm. a little bit cheaper, a little bit. So it's really, the, mm -hmm. know thyself is so important. If you don't understand who you are and what your strengths and weaknesses are, you will not succeed. You will just simply not, unless you have someone who maybe guides you, which comes down to like, make not the mistake to think that you're mentor and you really do need mentors. And by the way, I only recently paid for mentors for a long time. I found the people that were more interested in me succeeding and for them to succeed themselves that they would always be for free for me. And I would always say to people, when you start, don't pay the hundred thousand or ten thousand dollars for mentorship straight away, because you probably won't have the basics. And if, right, you, have, right. if you need to learn the basics, you need to, you don't need to pay for it. You actually go to someone who has been there for probably. I've met someone on the plane who was, was a billionaire and he says to me, he was just interested in me. And he said, you can email me once a month, a question. <laughs> there was a thing and he left it there and we're still in touch. And that's six years later. later. But I guess my point is really this. If you think this is another silver bullet, I need to have the right person to, to teach me all of those things. It doesn't work that way. You have to have multiple people. Some are really into compliance. Other people are completely into marketing, which might be the one that you need to do to first. And then on the other hand, you have to be teachable all the time. If someone says something and you said, I know it and I know it all, there will be no learning for you. I always mm -hmm. think if I hear something where I think I know the subject quite well, I would say, Overall, I have an opinion on that and I'm pretty sure I'm right here, but let's just step back and hear what they have to say. And if nothing else, through their opinion, 
I can form then a strong opinion myself, but don't disregard and say, yeah, 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 let's move on. I know it all. If they say it's an important point and they're a friend or a mentor of yours, then you got to take it on. This is your chance mm-hmm. to really get output, input mm-hmm. from our, our side. Yeah, I agree. We always say there's no secret room. There's no magic room. We're, we're not coming on this show and giving advice and then hanging up and going, all right, Sebastian, now let's talk about the real stuff that works, right? This is... Yeah, yeah. Right. It's just, you got to get out there and do the work. And whether you do it or somebody else does it, these things must be done. And what you, Mm. if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. And if you can't manage it, you can't grow or improve it. Right. And I I would add prospecting to the list of boring things. I think that prospecting is something, if you want to get paid daily, you got to get leads daily to get leads daily. You got to kiss a lot of frogs and it's not fun. They can be full of rejection. It can be all sorts of things, but these are things that are the bread and butter of business growth and success. And I agree with wholeheartedly. So now where do you think the future is going? Obviously there's a lot of new developments in technology, geopolitical things are at play. We've got unelected officials trying to push their agenda on the world and businesses around the place. How do you see the business arena internet? Cause you do business internet internationally. How do you see it evolving over the next five, 10, 15 years? Are there any trends or... I think, so So I'm in the health space. So I have a really specific yep. view of where health is go, going or wellness, like a bit of a mixture out of that. And then, yeah, let me go small first and then I'll give you the big, bigger point there. But so basically overall, the future is bright. There's no doubt about it. And if you don't believe it, just read the book like Peter, Peter Diamandis, Abundance, just really see if you have a slightly macro view, you can see things are going really well. Education goes so well, health goes so well, and so on. So there are many, many things. By the way, I don't read the news, listen to the news, I think not for the last 10 years. When people tell me about famous people, often I don't know them. And that's a downside because I can't be part of that conversation, but it's not a biggie. And it really gives me a perspective that I experience by being in business rather than just, oh my God, there's this happening. Oh my God, there's that happening. This will have that impact on my business. So external factors, I believe, are much smaller part of why a business succeeds mm. or not. Yeah. I mean, it really is because it comes down to the flyer drop thing. So I'm, I've, I'm in a mastermind with fairly large companies, employees in the thousands. And yes, they definitely feel when an economy swings one side or the other, but I also see then people saying, okay, what can we actually do? And it comes down to leads or it comes down to where exactly is our market? What's the issue of this market? Is my service still helpful or do I need to talk to my customers and say, what else do you need? There are so many stories of you can make it all work. So like overall, where is this going? First of all, often people think, oh, it's getting worse or you, you get this type. I found that, that that's for me, not certainly not the truth. I have not seen yeah. that ever really yeah. being an issue. I love that. I love um, that. I love that you brought that up. As I mentioned, we did our eight, eight critical success factors. There was actually a ninth factor. And I talk about this occasionally, and that was government and economy. But what we learned is that it, as an individual business owner, there's not a lot you're going to do to change the government. And there's not a lot you're going to do to change the economy as an individual business owner, or even maybe as a small association, like a veterinary practitioner association or the dentist association. You're not going to maybe influence government policy and change the economy. But so it doesn't matter if the economy is good or bad. It doesn't matter if the government is friendly or hostile. All you can do is focus on those eight critical success factors and try to do them, try to do them better. I think we do need to be involved. Obviously, COVID was a huge wake-up call for a lot of people that there are people who can make decisions that will upset your apple cart. And if you resist, the police are going to put you in handcuffs and throw you in a camp. These are some extreme examples. And it's almost the 80-20 principle where the 80% of your results are going to be focusing on the 20% of things that are within your control in the grand scheme of things, which is exactly like you said, which is focusing on talking to your customers staying in tune with the market. Is there something wrong with the pro- the sales, the marketing? Are we not fulfilling on our promises, right? Is there, yeah. are we training our team members enough? How are we managing our funds? I really love, I actually hadn't heard that. The exchange range, Watch, if you're in an international business, what exchange rates, Where, what currency are you keeping your reserve funds in? And then what are you paying out in? And are you watching that? And are you trying to time it, right? That's huge. When you have a payroll of a couple of hundred people, or depending on the size of what your payments are making. And then we think of fees into that as well. That can actually add yeah. up over a year. I really like that. I thought those were good tips. Sebastian, this has been good. There's been so many good tips and insights. I was looking around. If you notice me looking around, it's because both of my pens are dead. This one is barely working. And I was like, I got to, I'm like, I have a stationary addiction. So I'm like, <laughs> I got to have another pen around. I relate to that. Yes, yes. But yeah, I've got a couple pages of notes here. Is there anything I haven't asked you that I should have asked you? 
I liked your question in the beginning of how to start and what to focus on. I think that's a really key one and it doesn't change. The shiny objects become bigger, but they're still shiny objects. And so I think what you haven't asked and, and I think what's important is the personal routine because it's actually not much different to how you structure your day at work. It just is a real, little bit wider. I think the question to ask is like, how do you make sure that you actually can perform for a long time in the right way? And that, that's really important because for one or two years, you can do all sorts of things. You can burn the midnight oil and that, that's all fine. Most people have done that. I've done that too. That works. At one stage, it doesn't work anymore. And then the business still relies on you having that habit that actually really runs down your, your body, but also your personality. If you're irritated because you haven't had enough sleep for years, you know, that's not sustainable. And I can see that it becomes actually a personality that you talk to entrepreneurs and there's, you can feel that's what they believe they are and there's no way out of it. I don't have enough money to pay more people. And then they don't ask the right questions. What would it really take? And do you have to have more people or can someone else and so on? But it really starts with looking after yourself, getting up early and getting to bed early as well. It's super important because your yeah. mind is super sharp. If you, have a, if you have a schedule that sort of starts at eight o'clock where, you know, either you still have a nine to five that you have to work beside your venture, or if at eight o'clock the normal business of yours starts and you want to make sure you look after yourself and you want some critical thinking time, which ideally, you know, if you have a look at the book, The Road Less Stupid by Keith Cunningham, it's fantastic. And he talks about critical thinking time every day, sit down and think about one thing critically. That's a super skill if, because this will never go away no matter how big your business is because you will still make really important decisions when you're small and when you're big. So what that is really, you get up early, four o'clock, five o'clock, something like that. You have time to yourself, have exercise then if you like that or do whatever you normally don't fit in and where you need a really sharp mind or willpower, which is a power that gets over the day depleted it's a muscle that gets weaker and weaker over the day so if you know something needs to be done that you're not loving do it when you have the willpower which is in the morning mm. and then go through your day in a clever way eat well and certainly go to bed early and there are great books out there to tell you what you shouldn't and should do to actually be able to sleep and so on so i think like routine is absolutely so powerful and, and is a precursor to success in as entrepreneur or as an entrepreneur. Entrepreneur meaning you work actually in an organization and you do your thing. It doesn't really matter. If you want performance, if you want success for your family, for business, for your career, whatever, it, it starts with actually laying out the land and stacking the odds in your favor. Yeah. Sebastian, I want to hire you as a sales rep. As if only there was someone that had created a habit hero program based on critical success factors proven to drive results for business owners. If only I knew someone that had put together a program like that. <laughs> Imagine this has been well, so that's good. What your podcast is for. Mm. That's what your podcast is for, right? That's right. I'm, look, I believe our mission is to help create 200 new multi-million dollar businesses, how evidence-based methods, accountability, and step-by-step -step systems. And that's because before we had entrepreneurs and small, medium-sized businesses, it was kings and peons. That's really what it was. And especially with the pandemic, the business class, the middle class has been decimated. We've seen the largest transfer of wealth in the history of the world. And the world is trending back towards that. And so we need to fight. And the way to fight that is it's empowering the small and medium-sized business owner. We pay the middle class wages, right? A, a business that does a hundred million after taxes and all that, you know, yeah, okay. Maybe the CEO makes a few million, but they're paying the vendors, the staff, all they're creating the middle class. And so we really need to get this knowledge and information out there because I'm a huge believer in this. Ultimately, this whole socialism, communism versus free markets and capitalism is a battle between equality and freedom, almost like a yin yang. Because if everyone is equal, no one is free. And if everyone is free, then people are not equal. But if everyone is equal, then there's no reason to try to be excellent at what you do because there's no risk reward ratio, right? But everybody knows excellence. So what that means is if I ask, how many people are shopping today for a sauna, an infrared sauna? You could see indicators, but ultimately the market is unknown and unknowable. You might be able to see keyword searches and stuff, and they would give you ideas, but you wouldn't really know the true number. And it changes every day, every minute of every day. So the market is ultimately unknown and unknowable, but everybody can acknowledge and recognize excellence. So if you just focus on the problem you solve and doing it to the most excellent of your ability, that should see you through good times and bad. If you serve the customer, right? You really pursue excellence, but the, that's where we're in this big battle. And so right now we're hitting periods of equality and equal rights, and I'm all for equal rights on equal genders and alternative genders and that, but we just got to be careful that we don't sacrifice excellence for mediocrity.
And that's really where I feel like we have to empower the small business owners. You have a thousand hairstylists in a city. Some of those are going to be more excellent than others. And it's going to push the non-excellent ones to perform better. And that's how we yeah. manage to survive and increase our lifespan and develop and go to the moon, right? Because of these things. So I just think, wow. that, yeah, now we're going to Mars. And the billionaires were in a com competition with each other to build these things. So we really, really need that. So this is why I know you have your own following, your family, your own cut, your direct, rep direct reports, your own mastermind groups and that. I really appreciate you coming and sharing with us because I really feel that this hour we've shared, hopefully we'll be able to help at least one person, right? One person, 10 it, people. Yeah, even people. if it's just one, that's right. Yeah. Sebastian. So if people want Perfect. to learn more, where should they go? Look me up on, on Facebook, for example, or on LinkedIn, even better, more LinkedIn person, Sebastian Happy Mirau, M-I-E-R-A-U, or look up Clearlight International, they will certainly find me. It would be great. So check out Sebastian Miro on LinkedIn and Facebook, S-E-B-A-S-T-I-A-N-M-I-E-R-A-U, or go check out clearlightsaunas.eu. Again, Sebastian, thank you so much for your time. It has been an honor. Perfect, Yes, honor and pleasure. Likewise.